Okay. Oh, uh, what the heck am I doing? Yeah, I already started recording. Didn't I? The digestive system. What's another name for it? Are you debating? You're debating about the trachea? What's your debate about? No, but what was the question? Cartilage. It's not elastic cartilage. Those rings are an elastic cartilage. No, and we're trachea, so we, we're like the bendy straw. We're going to stay that way because of that cartilage. We're not the esophagus that has to constrict and restrict. Yeah, we're going to stay that way. Elastic, yeah. But do you see why? If it was elastic, that would imply that I constrict and stretch. But that's not what I do if I'm the trachea. That wouldn't be good because then I might do what? collapse. And we never want that to happen with the trachea. So while we were answering that question, you all were looking up what the other name was for the digestive system, right? And everybody knows now, right? No. It's called the alimentary canal or the gastrointestinal tract or the gut. And what's it for? Making big things small. That's what it's for. And that's what digestion is. Yes, ma'am. Yep. I saw the horse. That's what digestion is. It's basically breaking big things down into small things, small enough to do what with them? And then be used by who? Cells. So we have to get something small enough so that cells can pick it up and use it as building blocks for materials that their job is to make. Things like proteins and new DNA and new RNA and new epithelial cells and mitosis and meiosis and all that other stuff. That's what digestion is for, to give you the building materials at a cellular level. So. You break things down in this tube, and the tube basically starts here and ends there. Yes? It's a big, long tube. That's all it is. Now, there's a bunch of accessory organs that add things to the tube to help the digestive process break things down from big to small, but that's basically what it is. The tube is going to look a little bit different as we move down through it, depending on what its job is. But that's what it is. And the digestive organs are as follows. First, we start out with the mouth. The tongue is going to help us out. Is that part of the digestive system? The mouth really isn't either. It just happens to be the beginning of the tube that begins the digestive system. And what can we? say that really is the beginning, what is that part? No, 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 no. What part of the tube? What's, when does the tube really start? The esophagus. So that's next in line. The esophagus then goes down into a portion of the tube that widens up a little bit. Stomach. The stomach then continues on to the tube, which now narrows back down again small intestine for about 21 feet. We pass through the small 21 feet. Remember when you looked at your eye chart in lab and you had to count the tiles and stand? All right, so if you took your small intestine out and threw it, it would hit the wall. That's about how much small intestine you have. And then we continue on through the tube, which gets a little bit wider at this point, and we're, we're nearing the end of the ride in the large intestine, and then everybody's going to leave through the anus and the rectum. Okay? So that's the tube. There are accessory organs to the tube that are going to help with the digestive process. Now, when we start talking about the process itself, we see that there's a few different things that are going on. Well, first of all, we have to bring things in. 
the big things to start the process. That's called ingestion. And what do I do with the big things? And hopefully I do this well. I chew them. Do you chew your food? Everybody's going, oh yes. But I bet you if I sat with a meal with some of you, I would notice that you don't really chew your food. You're in a hurry. Ha, ha, ha. I got to go. I got to go. Chew twice. Swallow. We have things to do, right? Chew your food because this is going to help the rest of the process. It's going to help your digestive system be more efficient. Yes, ma'am. I've never heard that. Who's, where did you hear that? Another instructor. You can chew too much. He. Okay. Okay. I know who now. Um, I don't know about that. Well, how many? You ever count your chews? I don't think anybody is in danger of over chewing. <laughs> really? Yeah, no. I don't know about that compacting in your stomach. Hmm? I don't know. Yeah, I gotta look into that one. That's one that I hear, but mm, I don't know. I get it. I will need proof on that one. I'll check into that. Um, I'll go ask him. <laughs> What are you talking about? Um, but no, I don't think if you, the average person, I don't think we're in danger of over chewing. Because if we chew maybe three times before we swallow, we're lucky. But chew your food. Because that process of what we call mechanical digestion is what the beginning portion of the tube is responsible for. What? Oh, why is it doing that? Oh, yeah. There you go. Now we should be good, right? Damn. Why does it keep working? So, um, uh, mechanical digestion is what we start out with. That's a chewing process. We're going to continue with some mechanical digestion, but we're also, even at the beginning, and the major thing that's going to help us digest is something called chemical digestion. So even in the beginning when I'm chewing, I'm actually spitting all over my food when I chew. What am I doing that for? I want to add moisture because we know through our knowledge of chemistry that reactions can take place better if they're in what? Some sort of liquid medium. So I'm going to start spitting all over my food, mechanically breaking it down, and I'm also going to add chemicals to it. Very specific what? enzymes. We're going to talk about a lot of those. I do want to point out for your lab practical on starting when you come back from vacation, you want to make sure you know that chart in the beginning of your lab. The one that outlines all of the different organic molecules and all of the different enzymes and where I'm going to find. I'll show you that um, after we get through some of this. But it's right in the beginning of your lab. Make sure you know that chart because that's going to give you all the information about the digestive system that you need to know. So you need to know, for example, carbohydrates. What are they? And you know this already. Don't make me mad. Starch is a carbohydrate, but what are the building blocks of starches? Simple sugars, right? So when I take in, for example, a piece of bread, what is that? It's a carbohydrate, but is it a simple carbohydrate? Is it, is it C6H12O6? No. It's much more complex. So this process of digestion has to take that big molecule and bring it down to C6H12O6, the monomer of those carbohydrates. That's what I need at a cellular level from that food that I ate, okay? So in that chart, it's going to show you what those carbohydrates are. And you should remember that. Remember disaccharides and monosaccharides and polysaccharides? 
Did anybody have sugar in their coffee this morning? There you go. What did you put in there? Be chemistry-like. <sighs> sucrose! What's sucrose? <laughs> I'm talking chemistry now. It's a disaccharide. Okay, can you use a disaccharide at a cellular level? No! So what do I have to do to it? I have to break it apart. Now, which enzyme do you think is going to help me break down sucrose? Sucrase. ACE. A-S-E is usually the enzyme that breaks down whatever it is I'm talking about. Okay? And that's in your chart, too. And we're going to see who makes those enzymes to help us break down those carbohydrates. Some are going to be made in the mouth, amylase. Some are going to be made in the small intestine. Okay? So when you look at that chart, everything is there for you in nice chart form. And you know how nice charts can be because they narrow everything down for you. We'll talk about it in lecture, but we won't get to it before your lab test. So do yourself a favor and know that chart. Just a little heads up. Okay? 896 in your textbook. Let me make sure. That probably is. Yep. It looks different in your lab book, but it's basically the same chart. Okay, so what it tells you is the substance, carbohydrates, and all the different possibilities. And it tells you where I'm going to get the enzymes that break these down from the saliva. Also, the pancreas is going to contribute, and then the small intestine, the cells of the small intestine produce enzymes also. Those cells are called the brush border cells, and they produce enzymes too. Where is this going to take place? Mouth, pancreas, small intestine, and then how am I going to absorb them? Most of your absorption is going to take place where? Anybody know? small intestine. So continuing on with this chart, um, and this is the one I'm kind of quoting. So we started out with ingestion, bring it in, then we break it down mechanically, then we are going to add chemicals to it, then we are going to absorb it, and what's left, what are we going to do with? Get rid of it. Put out the trash. What's that called? Fancy science word for that. Defecation. So whatever is left that I could not use, that's what leaves the digestive system. Where does all the other waste leave on my body? I don't put stuff back into the digestive system to leave. Again, the only thing that leaves through there is what I couldn't use. So who else is going to take care of all the waste products from reactions that go on in the body? The urinary system, the respiratory system, the integumentary system. Those guys take care of all the rest of that waste. But again, what, what is left in the digestive system is what I could not use from the digestive process. It's what you can't use from the Twinkie or the cheeseburger by the time it gets to that point. Yes? OK. So the process, ingestion, taking in, propulsion. When I chew food up and then it goes down the esophagus, does it just like <laughs> fall into the stomach? No. How does it get there? Through a process called peristalsis. So rhythmic muscle contractions kind of squeeze it down through this tube. The tube is small. So when I swallow, what happens to the tube? It stretches, and then I have to squeeze, and it stretches, and I squeeze, and it stretches. You get the point? That's how stuff gets down into the stomach or the widening of that tube. So that's called peristalsis. Um, if you've ever 
not chewed your food well and swallowed something maybe bigger than you should have? Have you ever experienced the, oh my God, it's stuck? That's another reason why you should chew your food. Don't stress out your esophagus. Chew your food. Not more than 25 times, though, because I guess it compacts in your stomach. I don't know. So that's mechanical digestion. And they talk about a process called segmentation. Um, the tube is going to change as we go down. So there's different areas where we have sort of floodgates to hold everybody into that portion of the tube for a longer period of time. So we can kind of do what we need to do for the digestive process. Those muscles are called sphincter muscles. And they're going to close off different portions of the tube as the digestive process takes place. Then we have chemical digestion. And that's the enzymes we just mentioned. And then what am I going to do? After I make it small enough to use it, how do I use it? Yeah, I'm going to, the, I'm going to absorb it into where? My transport system, my circulatory system, yes, will then transport those substances to the cells. And then whatever's left over is going to be eliminated through the process of defecation. So basic functional concepts. There are different control mechanisms that are going to tell us when we need to eat and these control mechanisms are also going to help with the digestive process. Uh, when do you know when you need to eat? You get certain cues, right? Have you ever gotten one of those cues? Usually at embarrassing times is when that happens. Um, also, stimuli in the central nervous system are also going to be part of those controls as well. Um, it's around that time and if you walk from this building to La Point or to Jalbert and kind of pass by the cafeteria when they're cooking stuff, you might get a signal. Like what? You can always smell the cheeseburgers cooking when you walk from this building to that building. Does that kind of remind you of something? Maybe if you hate cheeseburgers, it reminds you that you hate cheeseburgers. But if you like cheeseburgers, I don't know. It might remind you, ooh, it's lunchtime. Do I have time to run to the cafeteria and grab myself a bite? So you get cues through your nasal passages. Your central nervous system is going to help by saying, oh, yeah, that cheeseburger smells good. Let me do a little rumble in the tummy because hopefully she'll go to the cafeteria and get a cheeseburger. So the brain is going to help set up the alimentary or digestive system for the digestive process. So these are some of the concepts they discuss in that portion of the chapter. So the relation, uh, digestive system organs and their relationships. Here they talk about coverings. And just like we talked about in the heart, um, by the way, this is the whole um, neural reflex pathway initiated by stimulus inside or outside the gastrointestinal tract. So we can get information from the outside, smells, the thoughts of food, those blasted commercials in the evening for Pizza Hut and Burger King. Those are visual cues. What do you think they're designed to do? Make you hungry. <laughs> And go do what? Go buy that stuff. Yes? Very smart marketing. So you can also get cues through sight and the central nervous system. Also inside, when we start to have chemical changes like my blood glucose starts going too low, what do I need to go do? Yeah, I need to go eat so I can increase those blood glucose levels. So we have chemoreceptors and osmo. What's an osmoreceptor? Osmosis. Water. 
So water balance, osmoreceptors are also part of the digestive process as well. Mechanoreceptors, those are pressure receptors. What the heck are those doing in the digestive system? It's empty or it's full. So we have stretch receptors that are going to be part of the digestive process as well. So some, those are some of the internal or GI stimuli they talk about in the textbook. Um, smooth muscle, the, um, some of these responses are also going to initiate peristalsis, the movement of those muscles, to either churn something up, and that's why your stomach goes, Arr. it's actually churning and there's nothing for me to churn, because it's waiting. It's like, okay, I'm waiting for the cheeseburger you just smelt when you were walking. Where is it? Yes? And we're going to talk about different enzymes and substances produced by parts of the tube, especially the stomach, when we talk about gastric juices. And this is going to set up for that as well. So we know that in the abdominal pelvic cavity, we have quite a bit of stuff. We have got 21 feet of small intestine, about 12 feet of large intestine. We got all these tubes flying around. We got a stomach, we got a liver, we got a pancreas. We have some kidneys back there. We got reproductive organs. There's stuff everywhere. So how do I kind of keep it separate and safe moving around in that big abdominal pelvic cavity? Well, I've got an extensive group of serous membranes. And we know what serous membranes are, right? What do they do? They line things, they cover things, and they produce fluid. There's fluid in there? Yeah. Everybody's floating around in fluid. What's that, what's that fluid called? This is the ob abdominal pelvic cavity or peritoneum. So those, that fluid is called peritoneal fluid. And it serves the same purpose as the fluid did in the heart and in the respiratory system and all the other systems that we talked about. So it's going to provide protection, decrease resistance, and we have an extensive group of membranes that are going to help do that with all those tubes in there. So we have tubes that line this cavity. What do we call that? Is it a P? The parietal peritoneum. We have visceral peritoneum. And then we have a group of membranes called the mesentery. And there's tons and tons of them that are going to kind of hold together that 21 feet of small intestine. I had to pack to go to, um, I'm going to California during my break. <laughs> yeah, going to San Diego. <sighs> Hopefully it's still there when I get there. Um, but I had to pack a lot of stuff in my suitcase. I'm one of those people that packs way too much stuff and always packs way too much stuff. But I have to roll it up and kind of pack it in and make it small. And the mesentery is going to allow you to roll it up and pack it in and make it small without squishing the tubes. And it's also going to be membranes that are going to help hold tons and tons of blood vessels. And those blood vessels are there holding together and being available to the small intestine. How come? Yeah, and this is where most of my absorption of nutrients takes place. When, so when they describe the mem mesentery, it's a very elaborate group of membranes that's going to help hold together the small intestine, very highly vascular group of membranes and they are there to help keep everything packed nicely. Um, we also, behind the peritoneal cavity, have organs we call retroperitoneal organs behind the, all of these membranes. Who, who can you think of might be behind there? Your, your kidneys. And then everything in the peritoneum is the intraperitoneal or peritoneal organs. What's peritonitis? Itis. 
inflammation of those membranes. Blood supply, highly vascular. There we go. Histology of the alimentary canal. Now the tube is the tube is the tube. The tube is going to have the same parts from beginning to end. But the thickness of these different parts is going to be different. And the cells that line, especially the inner portion of the tube, what do they call that space lumen, are going to be different as we pass down the tube. So they have all, the whole tube has the same parts, but the parts are going to look a little bit different. Everybody with me there? So we have to know the parts. The first thing we should think about is that inner lining, mucosa, associated lymphoid tissue. We heard that before, didn't we? Where do we hear that from? Yeah, the chapter we just finished, the lymphatic system, right? Pyers patches, remember those guys? They're down a little bit further. But we have in those membranes or the tissue, connective tissue underneath the lining portion, um, mucosa associated lymphoid tissue. We also have a lot of glandular material that's going to make things like mucus in that layer of the tube as well. Why do you think we need mucus? If I threw a bunch of mucus on the stage and tried to walk across it, what would happen? I'd probably take a header. I'm not very um, coordinated. It's slippery, isn't it? What's that going to help with? Exactly, moving things down the tube. It's also going to act to protect the tube from some of the chemicals we're going to encounter. So we have the lumen of the tube. Then we have that layer that I'm talking about is called the serosa. Serosa consists, excuse me, no it is not. It's called the mucosa. I'm up on that side. Serosa is on the outside. Mucosa is on the inside. So that inner layer is called the mucosa. The lining of the tube is going to be epithelial cells. Now, when we talked about epithelial tissue, what did we always, there were three things we talked about, right? What did we talk about? Cells epithelial cells. What was underneath that? Basement membrane, connective tissue. So that's what our mucosa is kind of like, except for the fact that there's muscle that the connective tissue is connecting to. So we have epithelial cells lining the inside, and that's what's going to change mostly. Then we have the lamina propria. That's going to be like our connective tissue and basement membrane. And then we have a thin muscular layer called the muscularis. And because it's in the mucosa, we call it the muscularis mucosa. Yes? Underneath that, we need some more connective tissue. And what do we call that? That's called the submucosa. Underneath the mucosa. That's also connective tissue. So in the submucosa we see a bunch of connective tissue and this is where we're going to find some glandular material that's going to help with the digestive uh, process as well. Notice that glandular material has tubes that lead to the lumen of the digestive system. What kind of glands are those? Exocrine glands. Very good. Which means what? I make my product here and I pff, spit it out the tube and put it somewhere else. Yes? So that's what we're going to find in the submucosa. Then we have a couple more layers of muscle. And what do we call that? It's called the muscularis externa, the muscles on the outside. Typically, there's two layers of muscles because, remember, muscles can only do this. Ready? But I want to do this. Yes? 
So if I can only do this in one layer, I better have more than one layer. So I can do this. So we have longitudinal and circular muscle layers so that I can make that squeeze motion. And then we have something called the serosa. And the serosa is the wrapping on the outside of the tube. And this is kind of um, helping us anchor stuff. Uh, nerve supply. What do I need nerves for? It's a digestive system, for goodness sake. Yeah, somebody's going to have those muscles contract, remember? Who is it that causes muscles to contract? Nerves. So that outer layer, the serosa, is going to help anchor things. And you see the term mesentery? We also call that the mesentery as well, that outer layer. So we're going to anchor things like a nerve supply and a blood supply, arteries and veins, to help um, get the digestive process down as well. Please don't forget the mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue, which is very important because how many of you sterilize your food before you eat it? None of you. Well, I shouldn't say that. Maybe, maybe there is someone out there that does sterilize the food, but most of us don't do that. So we need the lymphatic system and our immune cells to help us with that. So those are the layers of the tube. And as we go through this chapter, we'll see those layers are going to look different. But they're all going to be there for all parts of the tube. So next we go to the functional anatomy of the digestive system. And we're going to start out with the oral or buccal cavity, which is a fancy way of saying what? The mouth. So what does the mouth consist of? Well. Cheeks kind of hold everything in the container. So we have lips and cheeks so our food doesn't fall out when we eat it. Then we have something called the palate, kind of the roof of the mouth. And we already met the palate, didn't we? When we discussed the skeletal system. What was that bony roof of the mouth called? Yeah, the hard palate. Who made it up? maxilla, and at the very back end, there was the, the palatine bone. Very good. So the hard palate is bone, made up of maxilla and palatine bone. And then we have a little soft palate back there. And you know that little hangy dangly thing back there? That's going to help out with this process as well. What's that thing called? The uvula, we see it here in the diagram. Um, that's going to help, help us know that stuff's coming down. Because we have to do certain things when stuff's coming down. What do we have to do? <coughs> close off the trachea by doing what? Yeah, we have to close the epiglottis, which is attached to those what muscles? tongue muscles. So when we, the act of swallowing is actually pulling down on that and that's slamming the epiglottis shut. So that's important to be able to do, right? What if I numb all that up? Am I going to be able to swallow? No. They do that sometimes when they want to torture you and shove tubes down your throat. They numb all that up. Anybody ever have an endoscopy? That's a fun procedure. But they shove a nice tube down with a camera, check everything out and that beginning portions of the digestive system. Sometimes you can have another procedure where they shove a tube up the other end. Yes? What's that called? Colonoscopy. Yes. And, so, and sometimes people, um, especially patients who've had um, tracheotomies and uh, long periods of time where they don't go through the swallowing process, they can have a lot of difficulty with slamming that epiglottis shut. And, you have to be very careful with patients in that case. We don't want them to aspirate anything liquid. And sometimes we put um, thickeners in their liquid so that it goes down a little bit slower. They don't suck it up as fast because of those epiglottis issues. So that's the palate. And then what's this? Uh, what's it for besides sticking out at you? 
Yeah, it's going to help as you put food in your mouth for mechanical digestion. It's going to help roll it around so you get a nice even chew on it. What else? It helps you form a bolus. Now, what do you, how do you form a bolus? You masticate it. Well, what's mastication? Chewing. So chewing, mastication, forms a bolus in the oral or buccal cavity, which is a, what? What's a bolus? It's food, and it's a big ball of food and spit. So you're spitting all over it while you're chewing it and you're rolling it around in your mouth. That's the mastication process. I just want to point out before I go past this diagram, see the tongue in this portion of the diagram on this side? On the left side of the board, you see its attachment and relationship to the epiglottis. So when I swallow, I slam that guy shut. Kind of like pulling on the door when I, yeah, it is, it's pretty big. It's attached all the way down. And by the way, you cannot swallow your tongue. Did I already tell you this, digestive system? I told you this when we did skeletal system, didn't I? Because what's it attached to also? Remember that bone under here? The hyoid bone. So there's a myth that if someone's having a seizure, have you ever heard this one? You must quickly stick something in their mouth so they don't swallow their tongue. Don't go near their mouths, especially with your fingers, because all of those muscles are going to contract really hard, and what do they do? They're going to bite your finger off if you get it in there. They have no control over that. So do not put your fingers near um, the mouth of anybody having a seizure. They will not swallow their tongue. They might bite it really hard, huh? Don't put anything in your mouth. Exactly. And the other thing you want to do, I digress, but the other thing you want to do with a patient who's having a seizure is make sure you roll them to their side as well. Because after they're done, most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, they're going to throw up. Okay, or, th or expel something from their digestive system. So you don't want them to do what? You don't want them to aspirate because all those muscles are all confused and jumbled up from the whole electrical storm that just went on. So you want to roll them to their side so whatever they spew out, they spew out to the side and they don't aspirate. Just a little information you need. All right, so back to the tongue. So we see its relationship to the hyoid bone and to the epiglottis. And that's important. This is, a, um, this is a Jeopardy question. There's a little tendon that helps hold it down too underneath. It's called the lingual frenulum. Just in case, um, what's his name on Jeopardy asks you that question, you'll know the answer to that. So that also helps to hold it down. The thing that um, we already discussed when we discussed the um, tongue already, when did we discuss the tongue? We've already discussed this little portion of our book. Special senses. We, we talked about our sense of taste, and we talked about circumvallate and filiform papillae. What, what was in those things? Taste buds for our sense of taste. So that is also going to help with the digestive process. If it tastes bad, are you going to eat it? If it tastes rancid, or what are you going to do with it? spit it out because it's probably not very good for you if it tastes that bad. Although some people, you know, have different preferences of taste. But if something is bad, you're going to know it's bad and not, not put it down into your um, digestive system. So they also talk about um, those papillae, those regions of the tongue that house the um, taste buds. The other thing, before I go on, I'm going to go to the next diagram, but there's little openings or holes underneath the tongue, also up here in the mouth, the oral or buccal cavity. And what do you think those are openings for? Saliva. So the next thing the book talks about is salivary glands. Saliva is very important because saliva is going to help with the digestive process. Again, you might get cues from the central nervous system that will get these guys active. You ready? Sucking on lemons. 
What just happened? Did, it, did anything happen to anybody? Tell me what happened. Did you get a little spit? You might have felt a little twinge right here. Why? Salivary glands. Your parotid glands are here on either side. They're exocrine glands, so they're going to shoot their product, saliva, into the top portion of the oral or buccal cavity. You also have some underneath the tongue, sublingual, and then you have some, what's this bone called? The mandible, so in the mandibular region, submandibular salivary glands. So all of these guys are going to produce saliva. And just like going through a car wash, when you put something in your mouth, that saliva is going to spray from the top, and then it's going to give you an undercarriage wash, and it's going to make sure that as you bounce that food around, it's going to evenly get coated with that saliva. Now again, saliva is there to help with the digestive process in the beginning. So, what's in saliva? There's some enzymes, there's some enzymes called lysozymes, things that are going to start doing what? Chemically breaking apart. Now, they're not going to be too successful, but we're going to start the process there. We're also going to add very important fluid to that bolus of food and a bunch of electrolytes that are going to start the whole process of digestion. So, it's there to cleanse the mouth, dissolve food, moisten food, and again, enzymes are going to start digestive process. Most of the enzymes that we're going to throw in there in the mouth are going to start with breaking down some carbohydrates. We also have um, a little lipase that really doesn't do very much. Uh, they don't even mention it in the books anymore. It's called lingual lipase and it's also in saliva and it really doesn't do very much. We try to figure out why we even do that, but we do it um, before it hits the stomach. So know where your sal salivary glands are. Again, we call them parotid on the sides, submandibular, sublingual. And you have two sets of them all, so they surround that oral or buccal cavity. Who else is going to help me in the mouth make that nice bolus of food by masticating it? Teeth. So, your teeth. How many teeth do you have normally? And everybody's got kind of a different thing going on, gosh knows. Some of us have extra teeth, some of us don't have enough teeth, some of us don't have adult teeth, believe it or not. 32 normally. So normally, in an adult, we have 32 teeth. That's including what? The wisdom teeth. And why is there a lot of wisdom in there? Because we always have to end up ripping them out anyway. They're such a pain. Who knows? Maybe 2,000 years from now, you won't even have wisdom teeth anymore. Hmm. Yeah, you didn't have any? Ha! Huh. Evolution taking place right here. You had extra. Yeah, so we all, that number isn't hard and fast. Um, when you're little, you get your first set of teeth. And we're designed pretty nicely that we get two sets of these, don't you think? Why do you have baby teeth? Or what do we call them scientific? Deciduous teeth or milk teeth. How many of those do you have? 20. Why only 20? Because your face isn't big enough yet. Remember, after you're born, you're going to do a lot of facial bone growing, and your bones aren't big enough to hold 32 teeth yet. And as you get older, then you will grow them in. You push out those deciduous teeth, and your permanent teeth will come in. Now, when do we get our permanent teeth? Again, that varies quite a bit. It has a lot to do with genetics and uh, nutrition. But about seven, eight years, we're going to start popping those old teeth out and getting our new ones. 11 years, 12 years, and then the last ones, the wisdom teeth, between 17 and 25. And typically you have to get them ripped out before they even pop out. 
Does everybody who has wisdom teeth, anybody still have them? Oh, you do. Did they come in okay? Yeah, they're still here. Uh, good. Did yours or they? Yeah, yeah. They typically come in like this. And then my dentist was um, nice with my kids. He said, okay, I can tell those have to be ripped out. They haven't grown their root system yet. Let's rip them out now. So we did. Both of the kids at the same time. Don't ever do that either. We thought we'd save some time and <laughs> yeah, that, was, that wasn't good. But anyways, so we had them both ripped out. Guess what? The 17 year old went to the dentist a few months ago. She's got another one. It's like, what well, it has to be removed? What do we call it? I don't know what we call it. Because they number them all. You know, when you go to the dentist, each, each one has a number. Well, it was 32 or, or what was it? I think it was 32A. We'll call it 32B. I don't know what to call it, but we got to get it out. So she got an extra one. So who knows? But anyway, in the old days, I used to make you memorize those, but I'm not going to make you memorize those now. And those are your teeth. Just know that you have 32 as an adult and 20 as a child. Yes? Up. If you look at um, page 862, you can actually see them. You don't have a book? Somebody show her the picture. on. I don't think I have it. Oh, wait a minute. I'm, oh, yeah, I do have it. <laughs> right up here. <laughs> anyway, they hang up up here. So when they start forming, and they're going to form mm, probably about four, five, as those facial bones start growing out, you start them forming up there. They're going to hang up up here until they push their way down. And that's when they're going to push down or push away the deciduous teeth. That's when they fall out seven those ages. Okay? So they're all crammed in there at one point. So your children, sometimes at the age, probably like six, five, six years old, might, might exper start experiencing a lot of pain or even headaches. Might, it might be because of the pressure being created by those teeth, too. Teeth. What are they made of? What are teeth made of? They're bones. They're, they're not just any old bones. They are in a gomphosis. Remember that? Yeah, that's the joint created by the tooth inserted into two bones. What's this one? <laughs> That's the mandible. That's the maxilla. And then there's a special coating on the outside. And this coating that develops and coats the outsides of your teeth, the stuff that's exposed to the oral or buccal cavity, is the strongest substance in the body. It's stronger than bone. What do we call that stuff? It's called enamel. Um, so that's going to cover the outside of the tooth. And the inside, remember, bones are living things. Bones are living things that have a blood supply, and they have what? And if you've gone to the dentist lately, you can attest to this. They have a nerve supply, too. So they are connected to uh, a blood and nerve supply as well. What happens when I have problems with the gomphosis? And what's going to hold those guys in besides the joint itself? And that's called the peritoneal, or excuse me, periodontal ligament is holding those teeth in the gomphosis. We also have something else that is very important for our teeth in their placement. The gums, or the gingiva. Now, what's a big problem? gingivitis, which is inflammation of the gingiva caused by what? Nasty little plaque bacteria critters that are going to thrive on 
opportunistic little buggers that they are on the stuff that you eat. So what do you have to do to make sure that they don't reproduce out of control? Brush your teeth, which is good. But what else do you have to do? Floss your teeth. Now I am a bad, bad person because for many years while I was young, I don't need to floss my teeth. But now as I get older, I'm paying the price for not flossing my teeth because you start to wear away that gingiva. It starts to get thinner and thinner. And it's not good for the gingiva to be thinner and thinner because you expose more of that bone portion. So by flossing your teeth, what are you doing? Yeah, you go down in here and you get out all the gunk because this is where they like to hide. And what do they like the best? When you eat sugar. They love the sugar. Makes them reproduce faster. So floss your teeth. Get those little, they make these little sword things. Okay, and I have a bad habit. I'm going to tell you my bad habit. You know when I floss my teeth? When I'm driving on the way to work. <laughs> I got 40 minutes. Might as well be doing something, right? But floss your teeth, because that is important. And it's going to help prevent gingivitis and keep plaque in control. So don't tell, don't tell people my gross habit. I, I floss my teeth in the car. All right, um, I'm going to end there with my gross habit. And I hope you all.